Long time no see, Lieutenant Jacobs. Right, about uh, 45 minutes. It's noon, let's start. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this uh, town hall for the uh, Eastern Nevada and Placer County areas. So preparing for wildfire is the topic and I am going to hand it over. Uh, Paul, would you like to do some introductions? Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks, Pascal. Um, and I've, I've got a, a broader uh, introduction that I'll provide later, but uh, we do have representatives on from the fire law preparedness and community uh, uh, fire mitigation communities representing Placer and Nevada County and uh, very excited to be here today. And I think our first speaker was uh, Chief Estes from Cal Fire. Is that right, Pascal? I believe so. Okay. Well, good, good. Uh, I guess good morning, uh, good afternoon by two minutes there, uh, everyone. And um, thank you very much for um, for inviting um, Cal Fire on as, as one of uh, the partner agencies with um, all the folks I see across the top of the screen there. Um, I very much appreciate being part of this. And um, I've got a short uh, PowerPoint presentation. If, uh, Pascal, if you could uh, pull that up, I will go over that. And um, maybe set us off for uh, a little bit of the preparedness and, and the outlook for 2020 for the fire season specific to, uh, to the east side and the Truckee Basin. Do we have that, Pascal? If you just give me a second, I just had my my own screen that was, I just hit my own screen basically, I couldn't see you. <laughs> oh yeah, no problem, no problem. There we go. And I'll just let you control the uh, screens there if you don't mind, Pascal. No problem. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, <clears throat> you know, first and foremost, I just wanna, um, talk a little bit about um, how important um, for CAL FIRE for the Nevada Yuba Placer Unit. Um, I am the unit chief for the Nevada Yuba Placer Unit and, and the county fire chief for the Placer County Fire Department. And, you know, the Truckee Basin, that what we generally call the east side, North Tahoe and Truckee areas are, are really an important, important component for our unit um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, and most importantly, is the relationships that we have with um, our local fire districts and our law enforcement um, partners uh, in on the east side. Um, it's critical and it's something that I certainly do not take for granted. Um, and, and the reason for that is, is because the east side presents such a, a different set of scenarios oftentimes than, than we see on the west slope of both Nevada and Placer counties. Obviously the Lake Tahoe Basin is even more um, specific, but the, but the Truckee Basin um, really presents a lot of challenges for all the agencies when it comes to uh, wildland fires and the threat for large damaging wildland fires. And it has a fair amount of history uh, in, in the Truckee Basin area. So I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of where we were in 2019, some of our efforts in preparedness and what we're looking at in 2020. So in 2019, here's our stats. And the first thing you'll probably see is that, you know, our numbers across the board were certainly lower than some of those real draconian numbers that we saw in 2017 and 2018. A lot of that obviously was due to the campfire at the end of 2018 in Butte County. But, but in 2019, we still did see um, 7,860 wildland fires across the state in SRA, which, is, which means state responsibility area. Um, and SRA or state responsibility area for the general public out there 
it, you know, it, it really de is defined by about 33 and a half million acres across the state that is private land um, protected jurisdictionally from wildland fire by CAL FIRE in cooperation with our local districts uh, and fire departments across those private lands. In 2019, we had 258,823 acres burned and uh, over 700 structures were destroyed. In Nevada County specifically, across the east and west slopes, um, we have about 383,000 uh, 804 acres of state responsibility area in the county. And in 2019, just specifically within our unit across Nevada, Placer, and Yuba counties, including the east side Truckee and North Tahoe, we had 259 wildland fires in 2019. A hundred of those were actually in Nevada County, spread between the east and the west slope. But one of the things I'm really proud of, um, and we could not do this without our, our collaborative efforts across the board with local government, uh, federal and state agencies, is that in, in CAL FIRE, we have a very um, um, important part of our mission is that we contain 95% of all fires in the state, vegetation fires at less than 10 acres. And in 2019, all SRA fires in Nevada County were contained at 10 acres or less. So I'm, I'm very proud of those, uh, those efforts. Next slide, Pascal. Thank you. So look, looking at um, this last year's weather and what we're uh, forecasting into 2020, probably most of us that, that either work or live or visit the east side of the Sierras know that that the snowpack was much less than 2017 and 2018. As of May 1st, that snowpack sat at about 59% of normal. Some of those late season storms definitely helped with the, um, the more specific, you know, um, um, uh, lighter, flashier vegetative fuels, the grass and the lighter fuels, but really didn't have much of an impact as we got into the drying trends in the last month or so. The grass loading across the region is uh, much higher than average, but again, it's not to that level we saw in 2017 and 2018. The one difference that we are seeing projected for 2020 is that um, the monsoonal flows that come out of the Great Basin are not expected to be as wet or have as much humidity associated with them. So there is a potential for um, lightning storms and thunderstorms that we see on the east side to be drier than normal. And obviously that's a, a significant um, threat to ignition uh, for the east side, uh, specifically when you get into the higher elevations and into the national forests. So for CAL FIRE and looking at our 2020 uh, preparedness levels uh, and fire season, um, we declared fire season officially about two weeks ago. Um, it, it, you know, really we are in much more of a year round fire season the, these days. So it, it doesn't, doesn't have quite the fanfare that it used to when we declare it, but we still do declare it for legal reasons. Um, the bigger thing for us is when we cut burning off or suspend burning and when we look at our peak staffing levels. We do have a year-round presence um, uh, with engine companies, crews, et cetera, across our unit, but it reduces in the wintertime and then it increases as we get to what we call peak. So on June 22nd, we will go to our peak level of staffing, which is 22 engine companies, three dozers, nine hand crews, and all of our uh, firefighting aircraft at the Grass Valley Air Attack Base. Um, we are seeing some potential budget impacts um, as a result from COVID-19, um, both in some uh, personal pay and benefit issues to employees, but also potentially with, uh, with our general budget to the department. As of right now, we're not expecting to see any reduction in suppression services into the near future. We, do, we have received and have in service two California National Guard fire crews that are based out of Auburn, and we expect to see those in service through 2020. So that's an enhancement to us. And then at a statewide level, um, we have begun the implementation of our new S-70 um, Black Hawk helicopter program, and we expect to see the first four of those of 13 in service uh, through 2020 
probably as late as October or November. The very first one is actually on base right now at the Vina Hell attack base, which is just north of Chico. And it, it'd be very common to see that uh, flying in the Truckee Basin this year. And then we have um, all 23 of our air tankers in service with the uh, C-130 program of four additional air tankers that should be in service by 2021. That program is on track. So as many of you um, may know from last year's briefing that Chief Celine and I did, um, there, were, uh, there was a tremendous amount of money committed to some priority projects around um, the state. And Placer in Nevada County received um, funding and direction for two of those priority projects. And so as we look back over the first year of work on those, the Ponderosa West Grass Valley Defense Zone and the North Fork of the American Shaded Fuel Break, both of those, we completed over 1,800 acres of treated fuel reduction in 2019 um, across in excess of 130 different private land ownerships. Um, right now, we're looking at the direct protection of in excess of 8,000 private residents because of the work done. Um, and, and we had at peak over 210 personnel assigned to that fuel reduction project. And I can't, I can't say how important, you know, when I look at, I see Paul and Jamie and, and uh, Lieutenant Jacobs and people there that th these projects, whether it's the North Fork and Placer or, or Ponderosa, these projects would not have been possible had it not been for the collaboration between Nevada County, the Fire Safe Council, um, you know, the Sheriff's Office. I mean, it, it, it unbelievable collaboration to make this happen. I'm very proud of the results we've seen from that. Um, and, and we will see that continue over the next three to five years on both projects as we've kind of handed the baton to, to Jamie in, 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 uh, in uh, Nevada County and Jen Tamo and all the folks at OES to continue that work and we will continue to support them over the next five years to make sure that that gets done in completion. So specifically this last year on the east side in, in, in regards to CAL FIRE and our relationship specifically with the Truckee Fire Protection District, Chief Celine and his very professional fire district and the staff, um, we, we collaboratively made a decision based on some of the dry conditions to staff a fully funded state fire engine through the wintertime at Station 50 at Truckee, which is a co-located station between ourselves and Truckee Fire. Um, We'd normally staff two engines there, as you can see in that bottom picture during the peak seasons of the year, but we, we did staff an engine up there all through the winter. And it was a really, really great um, kind of evolution for our relationship. Not only did it add to the mutual aid efforts on the all risk fire and emergency mission, but they were able to complete some tremendous prescribed fire efforts uh, uh, in the Lake Tahoe Basin on the north end at Burton Creek State Park, as well as in the Truckee Basin. So I'm hoping that, that, that we will continue those efforts into the winter of 2020. And lastly, just um, forecasting what our efforts will be in, in the Truckee Basin this year. We, we uh, with peak staffing, we'll have our two engine staff with a battalion chief at Station 50 in Truckee, uh, our one engine at Carnelian Bay Station 55, which is Thanks to Chief Schwartz and his staff there at North Tahoe, we, we are able to, uh, to lease that fire station and provide that service in the north end of the lake. Really uh, something I'm very, very proud of is that um, through working with all the east side agencies, we uh, effective July 1st, we're bringing the North Lake Tahoe Fire Protection District, Chief Summers and his fire department in Incline Village, Crystal Bay into the Grass Valley Emergency Command Center. They will make up the sixth agency in the east side to dispatch with Grass Valley and the 31st local government fire agency across the board to contract for services. And I think it's gonna be just great for the general Truckee Tahoe region in, in bringing that closest resource concept uh, to protection um, of uh, life and property in the path of damaging wildfires. Uh, we will be dealing with our fireworks interdiction program again this year at the Truckee Ag Station. Um, you're going to start to see some preventative messaging coming out in the next week or two. And then we expect about a week of, of uh, proactive interaction with the public, both education and enforcement of illegal fireworks coming into the state of California. Um, and we will be aggressive this year. Uh, we have a reserve dozer that we have received at Grass Valley, Nevada City 
and we expect to try to position that when the fire weather dictates up into the Truckee area uh, under red flag conditions. So that's an added uh, asset. And above and beyond, like I started out this conversation, we are going to continue to work collaboratively with both OES, our local fire agencies, and Truckee PD, CHP, um, uh, and continue that communication, that collaboration, so that we are all on the same page moving forward. So um, with that, I think I'll turn it over, uh, turn it back over to Pascal. And I, I know that Chief Celine has a couple of things to add. Um, but again, thank you very much for the time and appreciate uh, being invited. Thank you, Chief Estes. And yes, Chief Celine, whenever you are ready, the floor is yours. Great, thanks, Pascal. Let me um, put up my uh, presentation here. Just a few slides. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chief Estes, a great overview, and uh, uh, we sure uh, enjoy the partnership that I think uh, the community uh, here in the Truckee area benefits uh, from, for sure. Um, I'm the uh, fire chief for the Truckee Fire Protection District, and we cover about 125 square miles on the eastern part of the Sierra. Uh, we stretch from uh, the west Highway 20 to uh, east, uh, almost to the state line, and it includes the town of Truckee. Um, we and our partner agencies are focused on uh, implementing a robust prevention program uh, that I think many of you participate in. Uh, but uh, I wanted to take a minute to just highlight these sort of four key buckets uh, of activity that are happening locally, because uh, I think since last time we spoke at uh, the uh, town hall last year, there have been some really good developments that uh, uh, we can all feel good about and, and are all adding to uh, our protection here in the Truckee area. Um, the first thing uh, I wanted to mention uh, just briefly, uh, and Chief Estes uh, gave a nice introduction to this, but reducing fuel on these large pieces of land around Truckee uh, that are near homes in the WUI uh, is a priority for all fire districts in the area. Uh, right now, there are at least four big fuel reduction projects uh, in progress or, or about to begin uh, in our area. And this is all since we were together uh, last year's uh, town hall. Uh, I wanted to point out, you know, one of the biggest projects, um, U.S. Forest Service is reducing fuel on about 2,000 acres south of Sierra Meadows. And uh, some of you are familiar, this is called the Big Jack East Project. Um, and, uh, you know, we're seeing immediate, uh, you know, fire protection to uh, the neighborhoods there from the work that they're doing. Uh, Truckee Fire is working with land managers to implement an 800 acre fuel and fire break east of the airport. And you can see the picture there of the map that uh, shows uh, that area. I know it's kind of small, um, but uh, this uh, project will protect the Glenshire and Juniper Hills and uh, Martis Peak Road uh, areas of Truckee. Um, and uh, we expect to see work start on that uh, in the next few weeks. Um, this town right now is spending a million dollars to reduce fuels on Tahoe Donner uh, roadways uh, in the 15 foot uh, um, easement areas, and this will make evacuation safer. And these roadway projects will continue throughout town roads. Uh, and then lastly, I wanted to mention the Truckee Fire District just received a $1.5 million grant from CAL FIRE for some uh, other big fuel projects uh, over the next few years uh, surrounding uh, the western part of Truckee um, and uh, Alder Hill and, and some of the land trust lands as well. Um, all of these projects will reduce the likelihood and the intensity of a wildfire in our area, and uh, it's, uh, we're seeing the benefit this season uh, on some of these. Of course, uh, defensible space, you know, is another uh, bucket of important work that's going on that I know many of you are, are involved with. Um, it's, of course, one of the most important things that people can, people can do um, to uh, prevent and a wildfire in their neighborhoods. Uh, we, along with CAL FIRE uh, and some of the other HOAs that uh, participate and get their inspection and the inspector certified, conducted over 3,000 inspections uh, last year. And we plan to do a, a similar number this year. Um, and crews are at work on this right now. Um, you know, the program works on this premise that people want to do the right thing, uh, but they need education and the information and a resource to help them decide what works needs to be done on their property. Um, and then we can move through a large volume uh, of uh, 
of homes and uh, get lots of people to uh, do good work on their property that way. Um, we also, as you remember last year, I mentioned a new ordinance in the truck area that uh, required homes being sold to have an inspection uh, at that time of sale. And I'm happy to report that we had over 600 homes inspected at the time of sale last year and uh, a significant amount of work that uh, got done because of that. Uh, disposal of material uh, that you remove is always a challenge, but we work with the town and uh, the Fire Safe Council and other agencies every year to develop a number of low, cro uh, low cost and free ways to uh, get rid of vegetation. Um, this season, you've probably seen uh, the messaging about the free dumpsters, uh, the free drop off that uh, you can see the flyer on the screen uh, still happening uh, next Friday, June 19th and June 26th at the Truckee Rodeo Grounds. And that's open to everyone in the uh, eastern part of the Sierra here, here to uh, take advantage of. Um, and, uh, um, and then, uh, of course, there's chipping and, and many other programs available as well. And you can go to our website uh, at truckeefire.org and, and read about those or the town of Truckee. Um, Firewise Communities, you know, last year we told you about this program uh, that was relatively new to our area and it encourages neighborhoods and neighbors to take action and to engage in uh, creating a fire safe community or what is called a Firewise Community. Uh, Firewise Neighborhoods, they come together, they communicate with the neighbors about fire safety, um, they do prevention work, uh, and then ultimately they can earn this designation and certification uh, that we understand that even some uh, insurance carriers are recognizing. Uh, last year at this time, I think I reported four Firewise communities that were in the fire district, but I'm really glad to report that now we have uh, 19 certified neighborhoods and you can see those listed on the board there and a few more in the works right now that are on the cusp of uh, getting completed. Uh, but if you're not a Firewise community and you uh, wanna take action to uh, participate, you can, uh, reach out to the fire district, give us a call, and uh, we'll get you uh, with our facilitator to uh, get that done. Um, the campfire ban, you know, lastly, uh, you know, as you've heard, 95% of wildfires are caused by humans. And we think improperly extinguished campfires and charcoal ashes are a preventable cause of fires in, uh, in our area. Uh, in the fire district and in the entire region now, we have an ordinance banning campfires and charcoal barbecues uh, once CAL FIRE uh, puts in place the burn suspension, uh, which this year is going to start uh, Monday, June 15th for our area. So next Monday, our campfire ban uh, will go into place. Of course, this doesn't include federal and state campgrounds, um, and it'll be in place until uh, we get significant moisture in November. Uh, you can learn more about the details of that, again, at our website, truckyfire.org. Uh, and I did want to point out that gas fires and gas barbecues uh, are allowed. Uh, Pascal, that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Sadine. And uh, for now, uh, we'll toss it to Paul Cummings, our Nevada County OAS Program Manager. Paul. Thank you, Pascal. And you know, I realized I missed an opportunity to introduce all of our panelists one by one. So I'm going to run through that real quick, just so that our audience knows um, who we have on today and maybe where they can direct their questions. So you've already heard today from uh, Chief Brian Estes from Cal Fire and uh, Chief Bill Celine from the Truckee Fire Protection District. So uh, there are our fire representatives today. Uh, on the law side, we've got Lieutenant Robert Jacobs from uh, the Nevada County Sheriff's Office. Uh, he's our uh, county EOC and evacuation uh, expert. Uh, we've got Lieutenant uh, Paul Long from the Placer County Sheriff's Office, uh, Officer Phil Cooper from California Highway Patrol. So those three individuals can all answer your evacuation questions. From the Office of Emergency Services, uh, you've got myself, uh, Paul Cummings from Nevada County. On the Placer County side, we've got Holly Powers on today. And then in uh, the town of Truckee, uh, Bob Womack, he's uh, working with Truckee PD as their emergency coordinator. On the defensible space and uh, vegetation mitigation side of things, we've got uh, Patrick Mason on, who's representing the county defensible space program uh, that works in the unincorporated uh, portion of Nevada County, and he's with Nevada County uh, Consolidated. And then uh, Mrs. Jamie Jones, she's the executive director for the Fire Safe Council. She's got a lot to do with the, uh, the green waste programs and some of the other things that have already been mentioned. Uh, Jonathan Cook Fisher on today from Tahoe National Forest. Hello, Jonathan. 
uh, we've got Chris from the National Weather Service who's going to provide us a summer outlook, I believe. And then last but not least, uh, Mr. Jeff Thorsby from the Nevada County uh, Board of Supervisors Office who is prepared to answer your insurance questions. So like I said, I'm Paul Cummings and I'd like to first thank you, Bennett, for hosting uh, these virtual community webinars and town halls that allow us to continue to be connected. And I appreciate all of you tuning in today to today's uh, wildfire town hall. I'd also like to recognize the Truckee Fire Protection District and the Town of Truckee Police Department in coordinating this event. During a major wildfire, we'll all be working hand in hand to keep the public safe. And County OES uh, works year round with the Town Emergency Coordinator to ensure the Truckee Basin stays ready. We have a great lineup of speakers today that'll be happy to answer your questions. We're here today to have a discussion around what it means to be ready Nevada County and Placer County. Uh, we all live in the wildland urban interface and by now we should all know that living here requires action on all of our parts to make sure that our community is prepared, is as prepared as we can be. We have a responsibility to make sure our homes and roadways are clear of ladder fuels so that our neighbors have a fighting chance during a wildfire. We all have a responsibility to have conversations with our families about preparing our go bags and practicing our evacuation routes. Today, you'll hear from a lineup of experts who are here to partner with you. We'll provide you an update on the current summer wildfire outlook, as well as host a discussion around COVID and wildfire first responder readiness, which includes evacuation and sheltering considerations. Like I've already mentioned, we've got panelists from OES and the Fire Safe Council that can answer your questions about our free green waste uh, disposal programming this summer. And then OES, Truckee Fire Protection District and Nevada County Consolidated Fire can answer your, answer your questions around the town and the county's defensible space programs and the county's hazardous vegetation ordinance. We want to remind you to get ready for those red flag days and public safety power shutoffs. We want you to use this time to get ready for summer and wildfire season by checking your go bag and checking in with your five emergency allies. These are people who will show up for you and who will you will show up for in an emergency. We want you to update your list of trusted news sources and review your family's evacuation plan. When planning for evacuation, be sure to map three ways out of your neighborhood and practice them. We also have representatives from Nevada County and Placer Sheriff's Department, as well as the California Highway Patrol to answer your evacuation questions. And lastly, we want to remind you to sign up for both Nixle and Code Red, as these are essential tools that will help keep you informed in a disaster. And I'll also make a a plug for a uh, plaster I believe uses Everbridge. So sign up for all of these tools if you're if you're in that proximity to, to those two different counties. And so with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Bob Womack, who's going to talk uh, talk to us about uh, OES from the town perspective. Thanks, Paul. And yeah, Bob Womack, Town of Truckee. Um, I'm the emergency services coordinator for the town, which simply means uh, that I have the responsibility for developing a lot of the plans then surrounding evacuations, notifications, uh, things like that. You've heard throughout all of the folks that have been talking so far how we all work together. And I think that's really the biggest piece um, of the puzzle in the first part is that we all do work together. The philosophy in emergency management is that we handle an event at the lowest level. So in other words, Truckee would handle Truckee, uh, the county handles the unincorporated areas of the county. But the reality is, even though it's at the lowest level, we're all working together. And if we need assistance, it's going to be there. And uh, that's really important because when we're talking about small rural areas, uh, as we all know, particularly with a tourist population, uh, we can get overwhelmed in a hurry. Um, our, fire and, our fire and law groups do have separate mutual aid agreements. But again, as you heard both the uh, fire chiefs talk about how cooperative the groups work together and the idea of the all hazards approach. Um, we're all sharing resources to try and make sure that we can do the best job possible. Um, Paul mentioned power safety shutoffs. I do just wanna to touch briefly on something so that uh, it, it's out there. Uh, NV Energy actually supplies the transmission line to Truckee and they uh, changed the de designation on that line this summer. So the likelihood of a PSP in the Truckee area uh, is greatly reduced. Uh, that is different though than areas that are covered by uh, PG&E on the east side, such as up on Donner Summit. Uh, so 
really important to pay attention to the whole power safety shutoff idea uh, and be ready, uh, even though we don't expect it to happen in the Truckee area with Truckee Down or PUD, it could happen with Liberty Utilities, uh, which serves a little portion of uh, Glenshire and the Placer County area of Truckee Basin. Uh, probably the biggest thing I really wanna to touch on, and we talk about this all the time, is personal responsibility when it comes to wildfire preparation. Um, all of our presenters have talked about this in one way or another, uh, but it bears repeating because we can't do this alone. Uh, we all have to be a part of the group and working together. Uh, so we've talked about defensible space. We're gonna talk more about that. If you have questions, we have some experts here that can really help you with where to take your green waste, what your uh, property should look like and how best to handle that. Uh, the other thing that uh, Chris is, with the National Weather Service is gonna talk a little bit about is weather. Um, I think all the fire folks would tell you that on a calm day, we probably are okay. We can catch anything. Uh, I shouldn't say anything, but most anything. It's when we have those windy red flag days and as I'm looking outside, I'm watching the wind blow. Um, it may not be a red flag yet and I don't wanna create paranoia, but we need to be aware. Just like in the winter when we pay attention to the weather, we need to pay attention to it in the summer because those windy days are the days that are gonna create issues for us. Um, as Paul talked about, have a plan. And I would say most importantly, when we say go, go. Don't stay and hope that you can ride it out or wait to see smoke or flame. Um, we're trying to give you the best chance to get out. And we're doing that by giving evacuation warnings and orders early. Um, along with that, if you're concerned about a fire situation and maybe we haven't already uh, given the warning or the order, then go. It's better to leave early and be at the head of the pack than try and be in back uh, dragging along. Uh, and then one last thing, and Paul touched on this a little bit, but I want to really uh, point this out, is have a variety of information sources. Nixle, Code Red, Placer Alert, Broadcast Radio. There's all sorts of ways to get information, but don't rely on just one. If for some reason that source of information is not available to you, you want to have these other sources of information. Some of the best things out there are being able to receive push messages. And I'll put the plug in if you're you know, on social media, Cal Fire, Truckee Fire, Truckee PD, uh, Nevada County OES, we all have robust social media. But at the same time, there are other ways. Um, Ubinet, KTKE, they all push information out and they're trusted sources. So I just hope that we're all looking towards a good season, that we're not gonna have anything huge and but we're prepared and ready to go if something happens. So I'll turn it back over to Pascal. Thank, thank you, Bob. And uh, I am just uh, gonna hand it uh, over to Chris from the National Weather Service in Reno, who is gonna uh, talk to us about what Northrop said and what do you think is gonna happen? Hey, no worries, everybody. How, how are you doing? Um, Thanks again, <clears throat> excuse me, for the uh, invitation to, to speak and participate um, in doing a few of these virtual uh, virtual things and I think I'm finally getting the hang of it. Um, so basically, you know, we've already kind of covered the seasonal outlook for what we expect. And, and, and uh, you know, from the weather service perspective, we, we think the same thing. It, it just, I think going into this year, it's different than the previous few years. The previous few years we were kind of spoiled by having just tons of moisture and snowpack up here in the mountains kind of kept things sort of, you know, moist and green for longer periods into the uh, into the dry summer and fall months. This year, we don't have that. And so we're already starting off dry. And uh, if anything, the, the signals are for an above average uh, temperatures for this summer. So um, this kind of opens up the, more, the mountain areas for, for uh, greater fire potential. So I think there's a key difference going into this, this summer that I, I want to reemphasize. It's already said, but I think it's really important to say it again. Uh, from our perspective, that's the, uh, the case. Uh, what I really want to hit on is um, is red flag warnings. Um, that's how the weather service participates in the process is we do the prediction uh, is that we, we kind of set the stage for hey these are the days where, where things could uh, go off the rails pretty quickly uh, in terms of fire with with windy conditions or with thunderstorms. So um, you probably some terminology you might hear especially if you're new to the area um, is fire weather watch and red flag warning. And so just like with any weather alert, there's different stages and categories. A watch is indicating kind of an outlook like, yeah, you know, these conditions may occur, but we're not sure, you know, the confidence is just sort of medium at this point. 
a warning is like, yeah, these conditions are pretty much certain to occur and, and cause significant impacts. And so that's the, the stage. There's different words, fire weather watch, red flag warning, but they're all kind of looking at the same thing. And there's two things that we look for um, to anticipate days where fires could get very large very quickly. And that is uh, gusty winds and low humidity. No surprise there. So we look for days where the winds are gusting above 30 miles an hour and the relative humidity below 15 to 20%. And that has to occur for three hours or more. It can't just be sort of hit and miss here and there. It has to be a, for a more prolonged period. And so we're actually looking for one of those, um, not so much in, in Truckee, but further to the east and more into Nevada on Friday, on tomorrow, uh, looking at a pretty good red flag day in, in those areas. And the other situation that we look for are thunderstorms. Uh, those thunderstorms that produce a lot of lightning, but not much rainfall. And the classic example of this here in uh, Tahoe and Northern California is June of 2008. We just had a tremendous lightning outbreak. <clears throat> Hundreds, I think even over a thousand new fires were started. And this set of thunderstorms actually came through at night. You know, most people think thunderstorms occur just in the afternoon and evening, you know, kind of the Great Plains supercells type of stuff. No, th these events, uh, a lot of times in California and Nevada could actually occur at night. And that's actually even more problematic because it's harder to get resources to those fires in the middle of the night as quickly as compared to the day. So um, again, when we put out a fire weather watch, that's kind of an outlook, a red flag warning is more of a, hey, yep, it's definitely going to happen. And the predictability does vary on those wind and low humidity days we can actually see those three, four, five days in advance. In fact, tomorrow's wind event for Nevada, we've been tracking that for a number of days now. I've been able to kind of message it and give people a heads up. On the flip side of the coin, there's still some things that we definitely struggle with in terms of prediction, and one of them are thunderstorms. And so those, those uh, dry lightning outbreaks, we may only really be able to give you about 36 hours, 24, maybe even just 12 hours of lead time on those occurring. And so that's there, there is a bit of a difference um, there. And so red flag warnings and fire weather watches have largely been a thing with the, uh, the fire services and emergency management to kind of give them a, an advance notice that, hey, you know, you know, adjust your staffing levels so that you're ready to, uh, to get on these fires before they grow out of control too quickly, especially in windy um, conditions. But red flag warnings are becoming more of a public product. You're probably hearing more about them on social media and say, oh, red flag warning, you know, what's that? And, and um, so the way I look at it, and this is sort of just being a little snarky here, it, it red flag warning is, uh, especially when it comes to summertime and fires and things is, you know, don't do stupid stuff to start a fire on any day, but definitely don't do it on a red flag day. That's kind of the bottom line message because that's when the fires could take off out of control rapidly and uh, not being able to, and, and first responders not be able to, to catch them before they uh, get out of control. And so um, I'll finish up with, uh, with red flag warnings. One thing you may have noticed if you live in Truckee is that there's sometimes there's days where it seems like, oh, you look on a weather map and now oh, the north half of Truckee is under a red flag warning north of Interstate 80, but the south half is not. Like, okay, what did literally the weather service put up a giant wall on Interstate 80 and like, oh, you know, that's where the winds stop and so there's no worries. No, it, it, the, the weather service, just like any good government agency, we, we have our jurisdictional boundaries and, and bureaucracy and things like that. And so to this point, there's, there's fire weather zones that we lump our red flag warnings in. And there's a zone that's south of Interstate 80 that kind of goes into the Lake Tahoe Basin. And then there's a zone that starts at Interstate 80 and goes north up toward Susanville. And so generally it's been, okay, this is fine. It is what it is. But because the red flag warning is becoming more of a public, um, publicly known product, is we are starting initial conversations to potentially move that zone boundary to the north a little bit um, for maybe next fire season in 2021, just so there's not as much perhaps confusion in, in the community about are you under a red flag warning or are you not? You know, just to make it just to make it clear. So uh, that's something that's kind of in the works now. So that's our stance from the weather service is I think we are preparing for a, a busier than average fire season across the board. And we're, uh, we're ready to issue those fire weather watches and red flag warnings because the uh, conditions um, are forecast. So that's what I've got. So thank you. And uh, Chris, before before you go, could you maybe, well, what you were talking about lightning and um, one of the things that now there's a lot of people listening to um, scanners and they will hear your fire weather report uh, that is uh, issued mostly by the, the Grass Valley ECC. And uh, there's always the LAL, yes. LAL of one, which is fine, but could you briefly touch on the uh, lightning and the levels? 
Yeah, if you happen to hear um, the fire weather planning forecast um, that we issue, we issue it twice a day, um, usually by um, you know, roughly 7 a.m. and then again about three o'clock in the afternoon. And um, in that forecast every day um, is what's called the lightning activity level. And so LAL. And so it's a, it's a number basically um, one through five, one through six kind of deal. And um, what that is, is it tells you kind of how likely or how, how numerous is lightning going to be that day. And uh, so one is no worries. It's like today, you know, there's nothing, you look outside and there's no thunderstorms at all. Um, but then you go up two, three, four, five, that, that indicates that the increasing coverage of thunderstorms with lightning. And then LAL six is actually a special one where that indicates that they're going to see thunderstorms with lightning, but they're likely to be pretty much all dry thunderstorms with no precipitation. So LAL six is automatic alarm bells, red alert, shields up, you know, everything like that, that, hey, this could be a, a bad day for a dry lightning in, in the region. But don't discount the days where LALs are two, three, four, five, because even when we have wet thunderstorms that are producing rainfall, if they're moving along quickly enough, that rainfall may not be enough to mitigate the lightning strikes in the vegetation. So, you know, you have a lightning sort of, you know, ticking along here with the thunderstorm and the rainfall moves off too quickly, then you still could get some new fire starts. So um, really anything, you know, LAL2 is very isolated, but certainly three, four, five, and definitely six are the, the ones I for sure pay attention to. Great, thank, thank you so much. And, um, uh, so we have a, a question here from some Donna Lake residents, and I think that um, that is it's really good. We live at the end, west end of Donna Lake. Uh, if DPR is blocked either back into Truckee or up to Rainbow Bridge, will the fire gates at the end of, of the houses on the South Shore Drive on the far side of Donna Lake that abuts State Park be open? They seem to be always locked. So that would be an um, evacuation question, I assume. Yeah, uh, Pascal, Bob here, I'll be happy to take that one. We, we get this question quite often and yes, the gates are locked. They're co um, controlled by state parks and yes, they would be opened. I mean, we're in uh, contact with state parks, the fire district and, and CAL FIRE are in contact. And if we felt it was necessary to open that gate, uh, we would get it open. Uh, with that said, if we are taking traffic out through Donner Pass Road, that's going to be the better way to go. Uh, the sooner you can get to the freeway, the better. The last thing you want to do is get all the way down to the end and find that gate shut still. Uh, but the plan would be to open that gate if we did have uh, Donner Pass Road blocked. Great. Um, <clears throat> can we uh, maybe also get a uh, a little update uh, going back to, to weather actually. And Paul, could you, could you talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, talk to us first of all about the red flags and then also the countywide red flag notifications and et cetera, and how the word will get out uh, on both sides of the summit. Yeah, thank you, Pascal. And, you know, as you've already heard, you know, uh, red flags are important because they're an indicator of threat of wildfire threat. And for Nevada County, the number one threat that you're gonna face uh, as far as disasters is wildfire. So um, we have many ways to notify the public. Um, you may have heard us talk before about Civic Plus. That's the first one I'll mention. And that's a county notification system that will send you an email essentially saying, hey, there's a red flag today. Um, you know, This is the duration of the warning. I would also encourage you, and you're gonna hear this as a theme today to to find the trusted news sources for your area. Um, so I've, I've got here the Ready Nevada County, Ready, Set, Go handbook um, that most of you should have received. And in, in that handbook, um, there are many trusted news sources that if you're tuning into during this time of year, you should be notified of a red flag, you know, listening to the radio, uh, you know, um, you've been at online news sources, things like that. Uh, you'll see visual indicators of red flags. So all of our fire departments um, end to end in the county are gonna put a great big red flag out in front of their fire station. Uh, when, they're, when there's a red flag, you'll see it in front of the county offices and we've got a few other partners that are gonna put those flags out. So if you see those flags, it means you need to increase your readiness level 
That means you need to be dusting off that evacuation plan. You need to be having a conversation with your with your family that if you're separated, you know, kids are at school and you're working at one end of the county and your spouse is at the other end of the county, you might want to just um, re-engage on that conversation about if something happens and and, and you're cut off, um, here's our here's our plan. You know, we're going to meet here, we're going to meet there. You know, this one will try to go get the kids. Um, you're going to have your go bag ready. Your your um, your vehicle maybe even packed depending on the conditions. And if you're at home, you know, have your, your vehicle back down the driveway and have it gassed up. My point being, you really want to increase your readiness level because the potential for a large scale fire is much higher. Perfect. Thank, thank you so much, Paul. And I believe at the, at the same time, it's uh, the, the general readiness of, of people, of the residents. So having the go back, having the five, being ready, being signed up to, to everything. Uh, the biggest question we we get several here is always about evacuations and why there are no specific plans for evacuations. So uh, maybe Chief Celine, can you maybe talk about why you can't tell somebody, depending on where they live in Truckee, which way they have to evacuate if a fire comes through? Actually, Pascal, I'll pass that to Bob Womack, uh, the emergency manager. He spent the time on evacuation, evacuation planning. Yeah, Pascal, I mean, and it's the same across the county and across the state. We just don't know where the fire is going to start. Uh, what we do tell people, particularly on the east side, is we want you to get to the freeway. So uh, Paul mentioned having three different routes. So that's a great idea. Uh, one of the biggest is if we're directing you in, either in law enforcement or volunteers or whoever is directing traffic for you, Follow what they ask you to do. The reason they're doing that is because they know what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, far too often we get people who decide there's only one way they can go. Uh, they don't know another way. And so that becomes a conflict that just makes it take longer to do that evacuation. Uh, but if we don't know exactly where the fire is starting or which way it's going, it's a little hard to ahead of time say this is exactly the way you're going to evacuate. Now, what we have done, and on the town website, there's an evacuation route map. Uh, we have main roads, all the main roads we've mapped out then lead to uh, the interstate. And the idea being that if we can get you on the interstate, we can get you either east or west, depending again where the fire is. Uh, if we have a fire to the east of town, we're probably not going to send people to Reno. Uh, by the same token, if we have a fire to the west of town, uh, we are going to send people to Reno. So it it really depends on where that fire is starting and where the winds are blowing as to exactly which way we're going to take you out. But the goal is always going to be to get them to uh, Interstate 80, uh, where we have the ability to handle the largest amount of traffic. Which, of course, make, makes perfect sense to get people on the larger roads and, and evacuation routes as soon as, as soon as possible. But there's also the personal responsibility that actually comes in there because you need to know where your where your escape routes are, where your evacuation routes are. And it's something that everybody should actually be practicing and <clears throat> probably at night, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and with, uh, with some fog, because if there is a fire, it's gonna be driving conditions or it's, it's not gonna be a nice sunny day. So that's that is something where preparation comes in and speaking of preparation the um, the green waste program that is currently uh running both on, on both western and eastern nevada county i think that is something uh jamie can you talk a little bit about what what is going on specifically for the east side of course hi everyone thanks for having me jamie jones fire safe council nevada county so we have two weekends left of the four weekends um for the green waste event at the Truckee Rodeo Grounds. And um, it'll run Friday, I think we're running 8.30 to uh, 3 o'clock. Um, or actually I might be wrong, 8 to, 8 to 3 is what it is. Um, anyhow, it's been a very popular program. People have been lined up waiting out front. And so we wanted to make sure again this year, I think we've in the past isolated some, some key areas that would use the green waste drops, but we wanted to make it more readily available and make it a more robust program for the community of Truckee as a whole, um, kind of a more holistic approach. And so in partnership with OES, 
um, and the funding that we received to help um, kind of build this program out this year, both on the east and west side with uh, um, Northern Sierra Air Quality, we were able to have four large event days uh, similar to what we're doing on the on the east or sorry the west side and so with that we have the two left um, which i'll be coming up on the 19th and the 26th so if you have not used those yet please uh please do so so um and then if you don't have the opportunity to use those as part of this funding opportunity this year uh, we also have the the defensible space chipping program that's going to be running uh in Truckee one day a week um, or as much as we are needed um, based on requests. So we're happy to have those uh, additional resources for all those people who are preparing for wildfire season. Thank you, Jamie. <clears throat> okay, here we are, here's, here's another evacuation question. How will we learn about if I-80 is gonna be turned into uh, one way in both directions. Is that even an option? Um, I'm happy to take that or else if one of the uh, CHP folks wants to um, as to what our plan would be in that area. Bill, I'll go ahead and let you start and then we'll, we'll add to it if we need to. Okay. okay. So one of the biggest things about turning I-80 into a one-way direction or what they call contraflow is that will create a very uh, difficult time for us to get fire apparatus, fire equipment back into our area. Uh, if we try and turn it into both, both directions one way, then there's no way to get our fire equipment into this area. Um, so that's kind of the uh, overarching concern about doing that. Uh, so that would be where we would start from. And the good thing is the way the roads are in eastern Nevada County, because they are small uh, singular roads that feed into feeder roads, arterial roads, and then into the freeway, which can handle the traffic from the different subdivisions. Um, the hope would be we wouldn't have to do that. It would be uh, a very unusual situation. So then I'll turn it over to CHP. <laughs> So the one, one thing to talk about really quickly whenever we're talking about going one way on the freeway that um, is extremely important, A, we're an interstate. So we've got people coming from you know all over the country that's coming through here, even though there is a disaster going on. So that is something to be uh, cognizant of at, when we're talking about this. But more importantly, um, normally we're not talking about going in that total contrafluge uh, direction. We're talking about pushing traffic in one direction. So if we know the fire's coming from the Western part of this Eastern side of the county, we're obviously going to try and push traffic going east and getting them away from uh, what would be the danger zone in that in that uh, complex. So if we have people coming out of Tahoe Donner or anything like that. We don't want them running west and going back and up over the summit. We're going to push them down into Reno where there's resources that can help them. And uh, and we can establish things from there and go from that point. Which, of course, again, makes perfect sense. And, it, and of course, the leave early don't don't wait until you uh the, you hear the the sirens and and add over the loudspeaker just leave early the other they leave the the better it is um also uh pascal so that people kind of understand we we certainly work chp works with their local their different area offices and we work with uh, nevada highway patrol we can shut the freeway down farther away from the problem so that we have the ability to reduce traffic into the area, um, which that allows us to get the fire equipment in, uh, but at the same time, it gives us um, a reduced traffic in the area that we can deal with. So a lot of this is, is what the planning that I work on, but we work with all these agencies collaboratively to make sure we've got a program ahead of time and we kind of have a concept of what's gonna happen. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that clarification. That, that's that's really important, and uh, I have a few people who asked about so basically the the coordination and the mutual aid between fire and law enforcement, how how that actually works because uh, there have been stories about um, 
fire and law enforcement not being able to talk to each other, being on different frequencies and radios and a couple of years ago. And somebody said that during the Angora fire, for example, there were issues. And uh, can you give, can one of you give some reassurance that these problems have been resolved? Um, Pascal, this is Brian. I'll, I'll, I'll start off just from the CAL FIRE perspective and then any of my partners can, can um, step in. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I just left Lieutenant Jacobs, uh, I don't know, an hour ago down at the Reed Center in Nevada County. And, um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things we were talking about was unified command. And so, you know, the, the question being, are there radio communication interoperability challenges across the state? The answer is yes. Um, and, and I don't know if we will ever um, be able to completely get over or, um, or have a completely interoperable radio system. There's just too many dynamics, too many, you know, whether it be topographic features, population densities, individual missions. Um, so, so, you know, speaking from Nevada Yuba Placer Unit, CAL FIRE and our relationships and how we run incidents, um, you know, we, we don't rely on the interoperability of, of communications solely. Um, we, we believe very strongly in unified command. And so what that means is that, you know, regardless of what the jurisdictional authority is for the incident, if it's a wildland fire on state responsibility area, you know, fiscally and jurisdictionally, it may be my responsibility. However, it's affecting a lot of other um, agencies and those agencies have their own jurisdictional authorities and their own missions to our constituents in the county. And so a very typical example would be a fire in the Truckee Basin that's uh, maybe a Cal Fire vegetation fire, but you know, Chief, one of Chief Saline's representatives is gonna be sitting right there at the command vehicle. Um, the Truckee PD, you know, Bob or one of his folks is gonna be sitting there with us representing Truckee. We're gonna have CHP there um, you know, to talk about those uh, issues on I-80, and we will have Nevada County SO or PCSO, depending on which county we're in, there to talk about evacuations. Because at the end of the day, you know, the fire departments have jurisdictional authority for the fire suppression and the life safety. The law enforcement agencies in California have the jurisdictional authority for evacuations, and CHP has that jurisdictional authority for the interstate system. Um, but we will be there physically at the back of the same vehicle, making those unified decisions and having that communication. And, and, then, and then that helps alleviate some of the interoperability challenges that we may have on radio frequencies. But um, I, I, I won't say that every time is perfect, but there have been a lot of lessons learned since the Angora fire and even the fires in Southern California prior to that in 03 and 07. Um, and I think we've come light years in, in our um, mentality about unified command and a unified decision-making standpoint. So, and I'll let any of my partners speak to that. Yeah, to, to jump on that, um, you know, what Brian said, uh, we all do have our own individual frequencies and things that we all talk on, um, but we always do operate in a unified command when we're talking about a, an event of this magnitude. The other thing to think about is, we all have our individual air assets that also have the capability to talk on different types of frequencies and talk to different agencies. Um, and they would be flying and available to help us all out. So, you know, like Brian said, it, we're truly in one area, whether we can talk to everybody on the same frequency. Um, sometimes it's better not to do that just because you have a hundred different people trying to talk at the same time. So, you know, with having the, the management team at the Unified Command or representatives there, then we can start planning and issuing out individual directives to our, to our agencies or our partners that are helping us out. Yeah, Pascal, that's, I mean, every year, Truckee PD, Truckee Fire, CAL FIRE, and the surrounding agencies, so uh, North Star, North Tahoe, Squaw Valley, and the Forest Service get together to do wildland planning. Obviously this year that looks a little bit different, but we're still gonna do it. Uh, but part of what we do is really enforce or reinforce the idea that no matter the size of the incident, when we're talking about a wildland fire, actually any wild, any fire, um, Truckee PD, the directive from our chief 
is our supervisor on duty will be at that command post. Uh, and part of that is to do exactly what uh, Lieutenant Cooper was talking about is the issue of making sure that radios are not worth talking with each other. Uh, and it, it really, once you get 100 people on the same radio frequency, it's almost useless anyways. We're better off being split off. Uh, but the, the way to fix that is we're all at the same command post, excuse me, same information and making the same kind of decisions. So it's really been worked out fairly well. Um, and I think like Chief Este said, we're much better than we were in the Angora fire. Hopefully we've learned a lot since then. Great, thank you. Uh, J uh, Jamie, I think you wanted to, to jump back in there one more time for to clarify some some times. Yeah, so I, I misquoted or mis, uh, mis gave you the wrong information on green waste. So it's the green waste drops at times are from 8 a.m. till 2 p.m. So I apologize for that, but I wanna make sure everybody has the correct information in order to participate. All right, thank you, Jamie. And uh, well, let, let's, we, we know that fire season is here and that we will have fires at one point or another. What we also have, of course, is the COVID pandemic. And um, can, can, uh, can all the agencies, can you address how uh, COVID has changed your, your preparedness level and uh, your response and what, what specific measures you take both internally, especially for the fire agencies, uh, how to keep your firefighters uh, uh, safe and healthy and how it's going to affect also evacuations and this the whole process. I'm Bill Saline, Truckee Fire. So I, I can speak a little bit to it, then I'll um, pass it off to uh, some of my partners here to mm -hmm. share it up. But um, of course, uh, you know, preparing for uh, disasters and, and dealing with uh, sick people and patients, it's one of the things that we do in the fire service. And um, it's sort of our EMS component. Uh, you know, communicable diseases is something that we sort of always uh, have responded to, and most recently Ebola in 2014. So it's not completely um, uh, out of the ordinary for us to have to ramp up our uh, personal protective equipment for our firefighters, because our first uh, concern, similar to uh, most of the agencies on here, is uh, to protect our people um, for obvious reasons, but also to, to make sure that we can provide consistent emergency services to the area. You can imagine in the COVID case, if uh, half of the firefighters went out sick on a particular shift and we lost them, um, then uh, we would have to figure out how to continue to provide fire rescue and, and the EMS ambulance services to uh, the Truckee area. Um, and that could be challenging. Of course, we have robust uh, mutual aid system uh, in the state of California that uh, we can rely on or uh, uh, that we had to uh, do some work on to uh, make sure that that was in place so that we didn't have a situation that happened in some other states, uh, most notably in Sun Valley, Idaho, where uh, they had to hire ambulance drivers off the street to uh, uh, maintain the ambulance service. And uh, of course, we never want to get to that point. And so uh, we pre-planned a lot on the contingency portion of that to make sure that we had coverage if we did have firefighters sick. But before that, we worked to protect our firefighters. And so what you'll notice now um, in uh, the Truckee area, when the firefighters go out on an EMS call that they'll uh, have uh, face protection on, uh, that they'll limit the number of people that are exposed to the patient, uh, that uh, they do uh, quite a bit of uh, detailed disinfecting of the back of the ambulances and uh, their emergency equipment. Uh, we use a lot of disposable equipment that uh, we get rid of. Uh, we beefed all of that uh, stuff up. Um, and then uh, we, um, you know, of course, uh, work with occupational health to make sure that we're providing testing and that we, when people have any signs or symptoms that they uh, are immediately um, quarantined either at home or we have first responder quarantine locations that uh, the county and, and fire agencies have worked to develop so that uh, they wouldn't go home and infect their family. Um, so those are a few of the things. It's very detailed and, and uh, complex. And of course, we follow the county health and uh, the EMS authority and uh, uh, the CDC guidelines uh, when we uh, operate in those uh, in that world. Thank you. And uh, Paul, can you can you add a little bit more to this? 
Yeah, and I'll actually turn it over to uh, Lieutenant Bob Jacobs. You know, he's our EOC coordinator and he's also our county evacuation subject matter expert to talk about what an evacuation would look like in the time of COVID. I know there's been a lot of restrictions with sheltering in place and then some sheltering considerations of how we might do sheltering in, in, with a wildfire in the time of COVID. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Yeah, Sheriff's Lieutenant Bob Jacobs here, your Emergency Operations Coordinator in the EOC. Yeah, as far as evacuation goes during time of COVID, uh, obviously we have to remember that a wildfire, uh, the danger of a wildfire is gonna trump the immediate COVID concerns. So as far as the evacuation itself goes, uh, evacuating with your own family or your own household members in your own vehicle, it's not much of a concern. The concern comes in as to your final destination. And when we talk about evacuation, naturally we talk about sheltering a population. Uh, we've already been in communication with the American Red Cross, who is one of our biggest partners when it comes to sheltering a population after an evacuation. Uh, in fact, we have a meeting with them today to continue that conversation. Uh, some of the things that are already being put into place, some of the planning and preparation for shelters uh, involve uh, situations where we have to select a location that allows a much larger size. Uh, depending on the population that we have to shelter, obviously we want to be able to maintain that, that physical distancing of six feet apart. So whereas we may choose a certain location for a shelter, uh, in, in these circumstances we're going to have to select a much larger location so we can continue to maintain that safe separation. Uh, there's, there's been uh, considerable uh, talk about doing screening, uh, pre-screening people before they even enter the shelter. Uh, when, they, when they come in, when they drive in, actually having that, that frontline communication there, having a public health official there with an American Red Cross folk to actually do a screening, maybe check temperatures, uh, have a questionnaire, uh, depending on people's uh, physical condition at the time or the way they answer their questions, uh, we may choose to isolate those folks, whether that is... Uh, have a separate isolation location at the shelter itself, or possibly look to shelter folks in a hotel or a motel. Uh, we've certainly seen a lot of uh, the sheltering in place occurring at the hotels and motels because it provides a safe place where uh, these folks have access to resources right there and they're separated in a non-congregate sheltering. Uh, obviously, we're gonna provide uh, the adequate number of PPE uh, for the population that we're having to shelter and we can do that here through OES, uh, resource requests through the state, we can get a, a large number of PPE in a very short amount of time. We do that working with our partners. But those are the main those are the main issues that, that we're looking at right now with sheltering. But again, that conversation is gonna continue as this COVID landscape continues to change. Yeah, and I wanna jump on real quick, Pascal, and just to follow up on what, you know, Lieutenant Jacob said, we talk about finding your five, which is really, having your community, immediate, you know, friends and family uh, look out for you and then you looking out for them. So even during this time of COVID where we're sheltered in place and we're maintaining safe, you know, physical and social distancing, still rely on that group of five. And if you haven't heard of the Find Your Five, um, you know, plan, it's essentially to, to connect with people that are, think of concentric circles that get bigger and bigger. You want some of these individuals to be on your street, some of them in your neighborhood, some of them maybe even outside of your county that you can connect with, pass information to, and especially during a red flag, uh, let them know your plan. And then if for some reason, maybe there was a power outage, your cell phone carrier wasn't working, their cell phone carrier is working, they come down the street, knock on your door and say, hey, there's a, uh, an evacuation order that's been issued in our area. Uh, come on, let's get out of here. So it's a mutual accountability. So I know right now we're, we're in this mindset of uh, avoiding people a little bit, you know, and, and especially in physical spaces, but remember wildfire is a, uh, is a high threat and we still need to be accountable to our, to our neighbors. Um, and I see Holly powers coming on and I was going to talk about the mutual aid side of this, that uh, a large scale event in this area is going to probably span two counties. So there'll be multiple notification systems. There will be two counties involved in sheltering, providing aid and evacuation. And I'll turn it over to Holly for her perspective on that. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate that. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Holly Powers, the Assistant Director of Emergency Services in Placer County. Um, and definitely I'm re going to reiterate Lieutenant Jacobs and Paul's comments, especially in the Tahoe Truckee area, where we're very much so interconnected in everything that we do. So um, if, we're, if we're moving people out of any community, really in the entire base in there, um, there's going to be that coordinated effort to make sure um, that at the Unified Command, which is already established and has been talked about, 
we have that communication as far as on the OES side of the house, uh, myself, Paul, Lieutenant Jacobs, we'd all be on the phone and supporting each other and how we're pulling together and supporting the sheltering aspects of an evacuation center or overnight shelter for our displaced communities. Um, and we work very closely with our health and human services partners, um, as well as the Red Cross to be able to provide the appropriate accommodations based on the community impacts, um, which would include the current situation and different planning that we're doing <clears throat> within some of the sharing atmospheres could include, um, as, as Lieutenant Jacob mentioned, bigger spaces, um, maybe putting pop-up tents inside of a gymnasium with walls on them. So your you know, camping pop-up tent now gives you a 10 by 10 space that your family unit would be sheltering in within that space. We can make sure we can maintain that social distancing um, and finding alternative ways to really support the communities um, that we've been supporting over the last couple of months through COVID. So um, all of these aspects are um, currently definitely under conversation between the counties and the city um, and how we best support each other. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. And here is uh, here's something that is uh, for, for probably for both counties. Um, I have somebody uh, saying, I understand green waste drop of possibility, but that means we need to have a way to transport it. The Nevada County part of Truckee has curbside green waste pickup included in the trash service. But our Western ca cabin is in Plaza County. And as far as I know, there's no curbside pickup of green waste. That seems highly inappropriate. So I don't know if anybody can uh, has a magic bullet for, for or a solution for this. This is Holly No, yes, I, I don't have the magic bullet for this, um, but I can uh, definitely check in with our waste management and see what uh, might be available. My, I saw Bob come off, so. <laughs> and then at, uh, a question going back to the evacuation is, what about for people that have RVs? Are they gonna be designated uh, uh, RV spots that will be open for sheltering? So Pascal, I'll, I'll go ahead, Bob touch on that, uh, the green waste real quick, because I, I think this is part of a larger conversation that happens quite often in the Truckee area, and, and really why we made this a Truckee Basin. Um, when they're talking about green waste curbside pickup, that's a town funded uh, project. It, it really has nothing to do with either county. It's because uh, the town of Truckee in its franchise fees and agreements that it's worked out pays for that service. Uh, so it's unfortunate that somebody that lives in Placer doesn't get that service, but it's not a county problem. It's really because the Truckee residents are paying more for their trash service to get that. Um, not to say somebody couldn't, obviously the transport issue is the problem, uh, but that, that's the difference there. And I'll let somebody else pick up the RV one. I, I really have never seen that question before. So. I'll I'll uh, I'll make an attempt at answering it. I think the concern I'm, I'm I'm assuming is because right now a lot of RV parks are closed or were previously closed because of yes. COVID because it was a congregate situation. But with stage three, I know Nevada County um, is allowing camping starting tomorrow, and RV camping should be allowed as well. Uh, we are waiting for any final public health officer modifications to that. But um, so I think to answer the question throughout the summer if you needed to do evacuate and cross county lines and if your option was to stay in an RV park I would still call ahead to make sure that they're open but I do think that that option would be available to our uh, residents on both sides of the county. And this is Holly too I, I'd reiterate that and I think we have to look at some of the emergency type situations so under the current situations RV parks are closed for camping um, and those social activities, but if, if we were evacuating a large enough group and we did have populations that had RVs that would be part of our communication and planning and making sure that, you know, we found space available um, for individuals to be able to use that. So there would be some communication and coordination at that level during that type of evacuation emergency situation. Perfect. And here, here's another question, and I don't really know which um, which county, but it's probably something that's that is prevalent in, in both counties. Uh, insurance cancellations and uh, what uh, what efforts? Uh, well, what efforts uh, do both uh, 
the town and the, the both counties do about the insurance cancellations because it, it is obviously a uh, a larger issue that needs to be addressed either statewide, but uh, whether what is the the current local uh, response to insurance cancellations? Hi, my name is Jeff Thorsby. Um, I'm senior um, management analyst for the Nevada County Board of Supervisors Office, and I can answer some of those questions at least for Nevada County. Um, uh, we've done a number of things to try to help address this crisis. Uh, one of the challenging things about this crisis is that uh, the root issue has to do with fire and uh, the risk of fire, um, but they correlate to private industry. Um, and so um, it can be a little bit challenging for um, uh, government to deal with and to try to help promote, but that's what we've been doing uh, at the state level. And so we've done a number of things. Uh, two of our supervisors participate in different state associations, including the Rural County of Representatives of California, as an insurance ad hoc committee, as well as the California State Associations of County that has um, a resilience um, work group um, that's looking at this issue. Most recently, uh, our board actually adopted a letter of support for AB 3012, which provides some assistance uh, to recovery um, uh, to folks who are recovering from a disaster, um, specifically requires an insurer to provide a payment of contents of no less than 30% of a given policy without requiring an itemized claim. So what that means is that back in 2017 in our fires, um, uh, folks, when they wouldn't start to have to rebuild, the first thing that their insur insurance companies will ask them is for an itemized list of everything they own before a, a cent gets paid out. So this bill, AB uh, 3012, will actually um, help alleviate that. So should a disaster strike, folks can actually get uh, be relieved or quicker. Uh, but then there's a couple other bills that from the legislature as well. I'm not going to go through all those unless um, folks want me to or they can speak with me offline about that. Um, but I think I, what I, one of the things that I wanted to mention are um, one of the things that folks should do if they really, really receive a non-renewal notice is the first thing they should do is actually reach out to the Department of uh, Insurance, the California Department of Insurance. And I'm gonna give that number right now, which is 1-800-927-4357. Again, that's 1-800-927-4357. And that is the direct line to the California Department of Insurance. The first thing you should do is call them they can help look at your policy and make sure um, if you've received a non-renewal notice that that's compliant with state law that's changed in the last year. Uh, there's new increased times to be notified. It used to only be 45 days, now it's 75 days. Um, and then additionally, they can help point you to other resources, uh, including the California, um, the California Fair Plan, uh, which is an association plan, which can provide some limited coverage. I think uh, probably a lot of our listeners today um, might have a California fair plan. It's important, it's very important to look at that. That plan is not a comprehensive plan. So it's not gonna include things for general liability or workman's compensation if you should do work on your property. Uh, so you need to look at what's called, need to get what's uh, referred to as a difference in conditions policy. So it's two different policies, they're matched together. Um, and so the Department of California, Department of Insurance can actually help provide guidance on how that works and also identify brokers to, um, to able to help folks find insurance or may ensure that they're properly insured. So that's the last thing I wanna mention is that a lot of folks feel like they have insurance, they haven't received a non-renewal notice, they're good to go. Um, and then, uh, and then a, a fire may strike and you may lose your home. And then suddenly you realize you may be um, uh, underinsured. And so that may create problems. And one of the things that can happen that uh, happen um, in a lot of places in California is if there's a huge fire that sweeps through an entire area, uh, suddenly the price of rebuilding goes up. So you you're, you may think you're properly insured today, but um, you may not be tomorrow. So those are really important things to be looking at today. Um, and I'll go ahead and leave it at that. I don't wanna to take too much time, but I'm more than happy to um, answer any further questions or um, provide my contact for further questions. Uh, well, Jeffrey, we have a question here from Gina who's asking about what about insurance premiums increasing by 100%? Is that going to be addressed? 
So that, one of the things to note that in, there's two different types of carriers of insurance in California. There's what we refer to as the admitted market, and there's something that's the non-admitted market or also referred to as the surplus line carriers. The admitted insurance carriers are gonna be your general insurance carriers that probably a lot of you folks may have or used to have, uh, like the farm, um, AAA. Um, those are all, those insurance carriers are all actually regulated through the insurance commissioner. So uh, an insurance, uh, insurance provider cannot increase their insurance by more than by 7% or more without being, without going before the insurance commissioner and getting approval. There's a whole committee um, and there's, there's quite a lengthy process to do so. Uh, but what they do, but they can increase their insurance premiums so long as they can show that um, it's actually um, uh, financially sound to do so, and it's really covering their the risk that they are under. Um, should uh, they receive massive losses in a certain area, that they can pay those back. Um, your surplus line carriers; those are your companies like Lloyd's of London. They are not restricted. They can essentially increase their rates as they see fit. So they could increase their premiums up by 100%. So to your uh, Gina's question, what are we doing about this? Uh, so there's a number of uh, pieces of legislation that um, are under review right now um, that are being looked at. Uh, one uh, is actually referred to as Assembly Bill 2167. And what that does is that actually um, allows for insurance premiums to go up um, but however, through a process that's called an IMAP process, um, it's a little bit complicated, uh, but essentially the idea is that essentially we require insurance carriers to provide insurance in a certain location um, to, uh, and that they can have increased, co uh, they can increase their premiums to a certain level, but then they're required to uh, provide insurance in that area so long as it matches their market share across the state. Um, but that would create an uh, increase of flexibility, but that would only impact and only affect your admitted insurance carriers. So for your surplus line carriers like Lloyd's of London and other folks, it would not impact them because again, they're not subject to state law, they're subject to federal law. Um, so um, I think that um, we are working at the county level to, uh, and through those different associations and through um, our assemblymen and senators to try to uh, put uh, identify and promote and support legislation that could help address that. Um, so again, if you are seeing premiums that are skyrocketing, I, I would in encourage you to reach out to the Department of Insurance for further questions at 1-800-927-4357. Thank you, Jeffrey. And uh, Jamie, is there, um, there are some uh, discount, some companies, I believe, that uh, offer some discounts for Firewise communities? Correct. So to our knowledge, USAA still offers a discount for if you live within a Firewise community, a certified Firewise community. And the California Fair Plan offers a discount to um, members who live inside of a Firewise community. Um, there have been a, comment, a few that have come online and then kind of go away. Um, it's because it's not a really regulated program, um, but there's no more way for them to regulate it between the insurance um, and FireWise USA, but uh, the two that I did mention would be happy just to see your certification um, notice. And, and for Nevada County, we have all of those available if you um, need access to that or your resident leader. And Holly, can, uh, do you have uh, an update from as far as Plaza County goes? Yeah, uh, same thing is true. As Jamie mentioned, the two um, providers that we have assisted seen give discounts. Um, as far as on the Placer County side, um, if you have a community that's interested in becoming FireWise, go to the Placer Fire Alliance, um, and that website can be found through the OES website, or you search placerfirealliance.org. It'll take you to our webpage, and that'll connect you with our FireWise coordinator. Um, I know we work very closely with Jamie and her crew as well to, um, you know, make sure we're we're providing assistance across the board for both Nevada and Placer County. Thank you. And uh, let's go back to um, to outdoor recreation and, and RVs. Um, is there, should there be a concern regarding traffic jams during evacuations with dozens of people 
uh, hauling trailers and RVs and slow RVs? Uh, what if somebody breaks down? So uh, just to kind of touch on that real quickly, uh, obviously, you know, impacts to traffic are always a concern whenever we're doing evacuations. Uh, part of the Lake Tahoe Basin Plan, uh, whenever we get into evacuations, is actually to turn uh, either 267 or 89 into one-way roads. Um, so that'll help facilitate the traffic flow of getting people in or out of uh, the Tahoe Basin. As far as getting people onto the freeway, that, that would go back into what we talked about earlier where we're uh, forcing traffic one way on the freeway. Not turning the freeway so much into a one-way freeway, but forcing all the traffic that's coming up the state routes um, and out of the side roads here in Truckee onto the freeway and either forcing everybody to go eastbound or forcing everybody to go westbound. And that'll allow you ample time to do that. But uh, just like Pascal was talking about earlier, um, the other more important part, and, and uh, Sergeant Womack talked on it as well, is making sure you're going right when um, that time is given. We're giving you ample warning for those evacuations when they do come out. So don't sit around, don't try and wait it out, don't try and fight it yourself. Um, it's pack up and go, get your go bag and go. And <clears throat> yes, the, the next the next question, that would probably be something for uh, Jonathan. Um, how is how is the Forest Service, how prepared is the Forest Service for the upcoming fire season? And what about the various campgrounds? Uh, in case of an evacuation, can people, will you make <clears throat> all the campgrounds available for people to evacuate to them if needs be? Yeah, thanks for the question. And it's nice to join you all. Uh, let me start first with the, the Tahoe National Forest. So my name is Jonathan Cook Fisher. I'm the district ranger here out of Truckee. Um, which is part of the Tahoe National Forest. And as a reminder, Tahoe National Forest is uh, from Nevada City to approximately the Nevada-California border. It does not include lands within the Lake Tahoe Basin. Uh, the, the Tahoe itself, um, we're, we're very prepared as we've been in the past. The Tahoe has 11 engines, uh, three hand crews, uh, two water tenders. We have one medium helicopter at White Cloud, and then we have one contract heavy helicopter at the Truckee Airport. Uh, we also have 10 prevention units, uh, fire prevention units that do a lot of patrol work um, and those are currently staffed as well. So one of the responses we've taken on early this year on the Tahoe is uh, we went into fire restrictions probably as early as we've ever been. And that was largely in response to what we see as the predictive services, the, the early drying, uh, but also an awareness over potential impacts on readiness due to COVID. Uh, and so currently campfires and charcoal fires are only allowed in our developed campgrounds. Now with, um, with the restrictions on camping uh, limited to stage three in the state, our developed camping is limited. Having said that, we are looking and currently prepping campgrounds in Nevada County and Sierra County in anticipation of opening a fairly large number of those uh, as soon as this weekend. And, and so that's, that's gonna help with a lot of what we've seen. One of the unintended consequences of the, of the, uh, the moratorium on camping has been an increased number of dispersed campers. And we did see a number of illegal fires, abandoned campfires uh, and trash related issues in our dispersed environment as a result of that. So with, with campgrounds opening up, we do like this idea that we're gonna get people back into a managed environment uh, where we can we can uh, have a better eye on sort of the activities and, and the fire situation. As was mentioned earlier, we continue to implement a variety of veg management projects. So the Big Jack East is probably the largest. It's approximately 2,000 acres. Uh, the only one that I did not see previously in Bill's presentation was the North Alder project. North Alder is occurring on the north side of the town of Truckee. And that's going to be approximately 1500 acres. It's mostly mastication and thinning and some old plantations. As folks drive on 89, they, they notice uh, that the forest stand becomes very similar and that uh, that's that plantations that we're currently actively managing. What's nice about the North Alder project on the north side of town is that it ties into broadly speaking, some of where we did last fall or underburning. And so we, we have uh, a number of projects now that ring around the communities that put us in a, a better position than where we've been years ago. 
I also wanted to get back to the question on COVID preparedness and how we might protect firefighters. This has been a real big topic within the, within the agency, uh, really as it relates to fire camps. So uh, as a federal agency, we're obviously sharing resources um, regularly across large geographic areas and how we manage crews within fire camps is something of particular interest to us. And then what is the response after returning back from a fire camp? Are modules, individual engines quarantined for some period of time? Do we simply monitor for uh, symptoms or uh, checking temperatures, these sorts of things? So that's, it's definitely something that's played into this year's operations uh, that's not existed before. Now, specifically on the question of evacuations, the agency has historically, and we would continue that in Truckee and also broadly in the Tahoe National Forest, is we can make our campgrounds available for evacuees, uh, temporary staging locations, anything that's going to be needed to facilitate public safety. And so that's a fairly common occurrence. Uh, it, down in Region 8, which is the southern portion of the United States, we normally associate that with a hurricane response. Um, and so we've done it very regularly, but it also does occur in wildland fire. Yep, and so that's the uh, that's the latest, Pascal from the Tahoe National Forest. Thanks a lot, and uh, it's good good to hear that you are uh, ready, and as all the agencies are. Uh, here have here's a question about being ready is from uh, Susan and Stewart. Is there training for the general public? in which they can receive instructions for using a personal fire shelter product, uh, protection. Um, they live at the end of a dead end road and if they can't get out, they might need to quickly deploy firefighting level professional PPE to shelter in place, which is expensive, but they're considering buying. Uh, I know there is, uh, is there a very specific uh, workshop by Cal Fire or Truckee Fire Department uh, to help them basically deploy shake and bakes? And is that even a good idea for people, for uh, civilians to, to have and to rely on that? Hi, Pascal, Bill here. Um, it's, uh, it's not a recommendation uh, that uh, uh, we would ask the public to do. It's a complicated um, process. It's not as simple as just putting on a, a fire shelter. You know, firefighters have uh, lots of training and they wear lots of uh, other PPE. Um, it's a last ditch effort. And similar to uh, firefighters, we would uh, recommend that the public evacuate early and that that's the answer, um, not to think that they can shelter in place and, and um, uh, last through a, a raging wildland fire. Um, and I know that's maybe not what they were looking for hearing, but uh, that's, uh, that would be our sort of simple answer on that. Yeah, Pascal, this is Brian, you know, to, to, to echo um, what Bill's talking about, you know, fire shelters are, um, are, are not survivable 100% of the time, even in last ditch efforts with professional, well-trained firefighters. And uh, it, it, is, uh, it is not something we turn to as any kind of um, just routine tool in our toolbox by any means and uh, uh, could not agree more that the, the, the absolute best safety net for the public is to be really engaged with the mass notification system and, uh, and to be uh, evacuating as quickly as possible uh, and get to a, an area of safety. Uh, agreed. And uh, uh, stood and Suzanne said, uh, well, what if the fire comes really fast? If the fire comes really fast, um, the time be, uh, that they probably will spend uh, trying to correctly deploy um, a fire shelter, um, it's, it's not a good use of time. And uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, both of you, for, for the reality check, because um, there is, right, unfortunately, there is always a lot of um, uh, exploitation of people's uh, fears, etc. That uh, people say, "Hey, you know, you can if you buy this, you can you can watch the fire burn around you." And uh, I believe that it's uh, these days it's absolutely impossible to. Well, first of all, it's always irresponsible to say that kind of stuff. But these days, uh, that definitely that flatly falls into the category of uh, false advertising. 
Yeah, and you know, another important thing, and I kind of reflect back to what Chris was talking about in regards to uh, the red flag warnings. Um, you know, I, I, I think that, that as we, what we've learned out of the last five years of fires that have um, overtaken communities and, you know, maybe caught people in the middle of the night in, in a defensive or surprise situation, there, there really should be no reason for that. And when we talk about that community responsibility and that community interaction with the information that's being put out there, you know, the seeing weather forecasts, red flag warnings, predicted extreme fire conditions is one of the most prevalent messages that we probably see on all types of media, including, you know, yourself, Pascal, who's probably been at the forefront of delivering that message for, for over a decade on UBANET. Um, so really, I think when people live in high risk areas and they recognize that the threat of wildfire is at their doorstep and then they combine that with, you know, uh, wet weather forecasts and red flag warnings, um, you, you know, the, the, the best thing you can do is, is, not, is not let reflex time beat you. Be proactive, have your material packed, maybe even relocate yourself if it's that, if you're that concerned about it so that you're not in a reactive mode, but you're in a proactive mode. The messaging and the information available to the public in California is, is probably like nowhere else in the United States in regards to um, predicted uh, fire conditions or fire weather. And Mr. Chris, I wanted to follow up on that. that uh, excellent point. I, I think a, another way to look at red flag warnings from a uh, public perspective is, um, you know, any of you who've lived east of the Rockies, you guys know tornadoes, severe thunderstorms. Remember, they'd, they'd issue tornado watches, you know, usually about four or five, six hours before the severe weather got into your area. But that was your time to sort of prepare and think about, okay, where, where's my stuff? You know, how can I get to the basement? Okay. Where are the kids? Are they at school? You know, okay. And so I think we have an opportunity here to treat red flag warnings very similar. Like that's your cue. Like, okay, let me review my evacuation route. Well, you know, what, what are the kids doing today? Can I get out? You know, if I'm in a super high risk area, you know, what they do in the South with tornadoes, like if you're in a really high risk area, you know, you might consider going somewhere else until the tornado watch is over uh, just to be safer. You know, so some things like that. Absolutely, and um, well, let's go. Let's go back to um, insurance for a second, and also a, a more uh, general question here. Uh, Douglas writes: um, Our homeowner's insurance was cancelled on October first, twenty nineteen, due to close proximity to native and non-native flammable vegetation. They have one tree on their property. However, their neighbor to the east has twenty trees on a one-third of an acre lot with a house in a driveway. Many of these trees are within 30 feet of their home and all of the trees are within 150 feet. The neighbor's property has been inspected many times by Cal Fire and Truckee Fire Protection District. The property passes every single time. How do we protect our home from wildfire when Cal Fire and local fire departments continue to allow neighbors to have continuous and excessive fuel load on their property and why uh, aren't CAL FIRE and the local uh, fire districts taking a more active role in reducing the fuel load in the community? Uh, if you are the fire authority, why are the insurance companies the lead agencies enforcing defensible space requirements? Yeah, Pascal, I can start off with that and then uh, maybe Chief Estates has some uh some broader views on that as well. I, it's a challenging question, especially without being able to look at the specific properties in question. And, and uh, of course, we're always uh, glad to do that. You know, and these are a lot of cases of problem solving that our inspectors and the experts go out on and, and take a look. You know, of course, total clear cut, you know, is, is uh, the safest, you know, if we take out every tree. And, and I think, you know, our inspectors are uh, following the public resource code 4291, uh, which are the guidelines uh, to create uh, defensible space and what we uh, think works now and that's in the state law. Uh, but with that said, we're always looking for reasonable ways to uh, reduce vegetation and, and there is some balance uh, that happens. Um, I can say that the most aggressive uh, vegetation management needs to happen within that first 30 feet from a home or in zone one. And it's the first place our inspectors look and they, they take the most aggressive action there. Um, 
And I, I'll say, you know, removing trees, though, um, even in that zone is not always the answer or not always the best answer. Um, for example, uh, trees uh, can create shade and they can reduce the growth of ladder fuels. Um, and those are the fuels that the fire can get into and jump up into uh, some of these big trees. Uh, removing and thinning the ladder fuels, limbing up trees, um, things like that is often a, a much better um, fire safety approach and it's um, cost effective, you know, it makes the, uh, the homeowner's dollar go further and getting more work done and more fire safety and more fire protection uh, versus maybe taking out a, a tree or a bunch of trees. Um, you know, removing trees, I guess, is, uh, is very expensive and there's a pragmatic uh, approach to this. And, and uh, I think if we went into a neighborhood and told people to take out a whole bunch of trees, it'd, it'd be expensive and, and frankly unaffordable uh, by many. And there are not uh, readily accessible grants available within the 100 feet from your house. Um, you know, these grants that we talk about are often in the uh, uh, larger pieces of land um, that uh, need to be managed. Um, it becomes a homeowner's responsibility to uh, manage a lot of that. So cost does become a barrier. Um, and, you know, I guess just to close, I think, you know, the other fuel reduction strategies may pay bigger dividends. Uh, removing pine needles, cut, cutting branches back from homes, limbing up trees, uh, reducing the continuity of fluids, uh, fuels on a property, you know, so spacing the bushes and those sort of things, moving the wood pile away from the house. Um, you know, those are the things that come to mind that I think the inspectors can really get to a lot of properties. Um, they can get a lot of volume and they can get a lot of fire uh, safety uh, activity in a neighborhood uh, short of um, clear cutting and removing big trees and things like that. So it's maybe not the answer that, uh, um, that uh, Doug wanted to hear, but um, you know, I think uh, those are some of the things right off the top of my head. I don't know, uh, Chief, if you have anything else to add to that. I think you, you explained it well, Bill. You know, the, 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 the tenants of PRC 4291, which, which going back into history a little bit, as you all know, was, was, the, was the 30 foot defensible space, which was increased to 100 foot defensible space was zone one B in that 30. It was never developed or designed to be um, a, conver a complete conversion of, of property to, to no vegetation. Um, and as it stands today, that remains true. It's, it's really to reduce the continuity of fuels and the advancement of fire from the ground up into the canopies, which when, it, when, it, when, a, when a fire gets into the canopies is when you see the most ember cast being spread through spot fires. And then those ember casts, that ember cast looks for a receptive fuel bed. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a simple concept. And a lot of times that receptive fuel bed at a property may not be the trees. It, it might be the woodshed. It might be the flammables. It might be the th you know the lawn furniture stored under the deck. It, it could it could be the pine needles in the rain gutters or things like that. Um, so I think that that you know I don't I don't ever want anyone to to look at and really inspectors try to look at things in a holistic manner. Um, it's really much more than just the actual vegetative matter. It's looking at, re at breaking up that continuity of fuels and the spread of the fire. Um, and so, yeah, well, well said, Bill, and I, I agree with, with everything you said. So I'd like to just add two uh, or one quick thing on that is that uh, our inspectors in the Truckee area have um, a, a couple tools that they can use that uh, some people often ask, uh, you know, my property goes uh, 70 feet to the property line and I have another 30 feet that goes into the neighbor's property, can we do anything about that? And, and under the, uh, the more broader state uh, public resource code, uh, we, don't, we can't really address those neighbor's property. However, in uh, the town of Truckee or in the Truckee Fire District, excuse me, we have um, an ordinance uh, from 2012 that allows us to enforce defensible space requirements to the 4291 standards um, on somebody else's property if it impinges on your 100 feet. And, I'll add that Nevada County also has similar uh, language and enforcement tools. So from time to time when uh, people aren't taking any action uh, and their uh, unsafe uh, wildland and their uh, property is affecting your 100 feet, uh, we uh, are able to enforce those and we do take action. And, and although it's rare in some cases, 
um, in the fire district, we have uh, actually uh, went in with tractors and done the work and put a lien on a person's property. And, and so we're not afraid to take action when we think that there is nothing being done or people uh, are not responding at all uh, to uh, the fire danger. And that, that same uh, very similar ordinance was passed in Placer County um, about a month and a half ago, went into effect um, and has the same, uh, same, same parameters that Chief Celine just talked about regarding uh, unimproved parcels. You know, one of, I think one of the specifics about PRC 4291 is it only deals with parcels with a habitable structure, um, which is limiting. And so um, what these local ordinances do is um, allow, uh, allow it to be able to apply either, like Bill said, to apply that 100 feet across property lines or in the case of the Placer County ordinance to be able to apply it to unimproved parcels or parcels without a habitable structure. And just to build on this conversation, uh, on the Forest Service side, we do authorize adjacent private landowners to treat neighboring national forest system lands uh, to some extent for defensible space purposes uh, up to the 100 feet in support of that. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. And I know that uh, there's also questions about about um, another federal agency BLM if they if they would if they are allowing the the same thing but uh, we don't have a representative from BLM on the panel my apologies for that uh, I'll try and find and find that question and uh, <clears throat> as well uh, yeah well real quick I think there's also something really important to understand when it comes to these insurance letters quite often they're sent out by companies broadly, it really doesn't matter what the homeowner does or does not do or the neighbor does or does not do. Uh, they write the letters in such a way that they're going to cancel the insurance because they feel they're oversubscribed and it's gonna cost their company too much money if something happens. So while we all try and deal with defensible space and we have some really good programs, in the end, um, and I can speak from personal experience, it doesn't matter what we do, the company wants out and that's what their decision is. Um, and I think that that's some of the stuff that Jeff was talking about in terms of trying to deal with this in a legislative way, which is very difficult, but we're talking about two different things and it, it's important to realize those. An insurance letter very rarely is because the property really is that bad. It's because they want out of the area. Uh, so that's important to note when we're trying to talk about the different organizations that are trying to take care of uh, doing inspections, we could do the best job in the world, but if they want out, that's what they're going to do. Yes, Bob, th th thank you for, for actually uh, for the reality check, because I, I think that's, that is more often than not, it is, uh, it is easy to say, oh, hey, um, it's because you're defensible space, but it's really not, but uh, Jeffrey, can, can you add a little bit on there maybe? Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> um, I think, uh, you know, I think Bob's point was a really good one. And one of the things that um, as the last year and a half that we've been really kind of diving deep into this issue, one of the things that we learned is a lot of these insurance companies, they're, they really are looking at potentially enormous risk uh, when they're looking at their entire portfolio. But what becomes very frustrating for the homeowners and for a lot of us is that um, just what Bob said, they're not looking specifically at, at potentially, I mean, they could be not, you know, it's case by case, but a lot of times they're not looking just at an individual property. They're looking at an entire region and they say, we want to cut down, either we want to pull out completely or we want to lower our risk portfolio by 60% in this area. So they'll just randomly start send out non-renewal notices, or they'll be looking at the region. So they may be looking at using satellite imagery and they say, oh, and it's very difficult obviously in our area because there's so much tree cover. And so that becomes very problematic. So you may be doing everything possible to make sure your property is completely mitigated. And then just, you know, basically a quarter of a mile down the road, somebody's not doing that. Well, from the um, uh, insurance company's perspective, they say, well, if there's a fire that other property and Ember flies over in a high risk or high wind in, um, you know, incident, and then suddenly your house is getting caught on fire. And so that's why it's really important. And that's why we're 
really trying to advocate for solutions there, incorporating, um, you know, certification programs through the, um, you know, um, fire community programs and things like that. And really looking at a regional level is not is really important. Um, but you know, and so um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to add that. And uh, the last thing I wanted to add was another thing that's really important that we're also advocating for at the legislative level is really for increased transparency in the risk modeling that's done by insurance corporations. There is no specific standard on how risk modeling is done. Uh, so you have different uh, insurance companies basically using different methodologies on how they're determining those factors. Um, and that be creates a real challenge, not only for homeowners, but it creates a challenge for our fire folks who, you know, they may be asked to go and look at, a, 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 you know, look at uh, and provide some type of evaluation. Uh, but that's not necessarily what the insurance company is going to be uh, grading how they make their decisions. By. And that be creates a real challenge for us as we try to mitigate the, uh, and uh, do course correction for those purposes. So hopefully that's helpful. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeffrey. And uh, <clears throat> we are getting close to the uh, the end of uh, our allotted time. So uh, I'm going to join Lynn in asking uh, what three things uh, should we take away from today's town hall? Uh, each if each of you could give us the three uh, the, the three most important things for you that uh, we as the general public should should take away and do right now. Hi, Pascal, Bill Celine here. Um, great question from Lynn and uh, the three things that come to mind uh, that was mentioned already that uh, people should really understand how uh, we are gonna communicate with them in an evacuation. And that depends on what county you live in. But I can say that generally speaking in the Truckee uh, Basin, which includes North Star, fire agencies will rapidly be able to communicate uh, to you through the Nixel system um, and uh, 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 Truckee PD. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, the other counties, uh, Everbridge and Code Red are uh, equally as important. So you should be on all those systems on your phone so you can get those and leave your phone on at night during red flag events, especially uh, at night. Uh, number two is get ready for evacuation. You should have a go bag packed. Uh, by the door and uh, ready to go uh, and be watching the weather just like we do in ski season watching the weather for critical fire weather and red flag warnings during the summertime is uh, is important and life saving uh, and get you out of the way early and if it if it freaks you out uh, wildfire um, and uh, you feel a lot of anxiety I heard somebody say hey on a red flag day just uh, leave the area and go to Reno and watch a movie and go to dinner and uh, and be out during the, those afternoon times. Uh, the last thing, of course, uh, from a fire agency perspective, reduce fuels around your property, especially within the 30 feet from your house. Any reduction in fuels is helpful. And so um, doing something is better than doing nothing. That's my three. Thank you, Bill. I'll, I'll tag on to Chief Celine there. He's a hard act to follow, but I'll do my best. Uh, <laughs> So the first thing I would say is, uh, is uh, maybe a, a statement of, of hopefully assuredness to our public out there, our constituents, and that is that, that um, rest assured that regardless of what the emergency in front of us is, um, you have your law enforcement, your local emergency management, and your fire agencies committed to collaboration. We, we really believe in and we execute the most um, efficient manners for dispatching, getting the resources to the scene of the emergency, regardless of the patch on the door, and um, ensuring that, you know, the health and welfare of our people is, 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 you know, paramount on the front of our minds. So that, and that doesn't exist in all places in the state. I'll just be real honest with you, but it does exist here in Placer and Nevada counties, and it's not something that we take lightly. Um, and the second, the second and third are, are similar in nature. Um, you know, I, I, I used to talk about this three-legged stool, kind of the suppression, the, the prevention, and the personal responsibility. And there was a lot talked about the personal responsibility today. And, and I think it's very important for people to understand that they have to get involved. It's not, it's not just the mass notification. It's not just looking at the weather forecast. It's, it's it's what Paul talked a little bit about in getting to know your community and knowing your neighbors and um, 
talking and communicating and getting involved in the local fire safe councils because the amount of information available, especially when you live in rural areas, um, we can't sequester ourselves to this kind of rural lifestyle when we live in a very threatening environment to, to wildland fires and we need that community involvement to, to keep our, our public safe. Um, and thirdly, to tag onto that, there was, uh, there was a, a, a term coined about 10 years ago um, by our agency, and that was, uh, you provide the defense and we'll provide the offense. And I think it was kind of ahead of its time a little bit, um, but I could not think of a better message today that kind of encapsulates everything that, that you know, Chief Celine and all, all the fire agencies and, and OES are talking about is you, you do your part and I guarantee you, we will do our part. And I'll leave it at that. So thanks, Pascal. Thank you, Brian. I think from uh, our perspective, it's, uh, you know, the safe and efficient flow of traffic, regardless of what the incident is or the emergency is, is, is primary and paramount, regardless of whether it's CHP or another law enforcement agency or a volunteer, um, you know, that's our goal is to get people out. Um, I would start early. I think it's been mentioned before. Many of us get very comfortable in the ways that we go to and from a particular okay. location, whether it be home or work or to the store, um, you know, venture out and look for other ways to get around and uh, be familiar with some of the fire gates or panels that are um, that are out there that you, you know, might be secondarily methods to get around. Um, and then third is, you know, if, uh, if we're out there directing traffic and by we, I mean anyone, out there directing traffic that's in law enforcement or fire, if they're telling you to go a specific way, um, spending time to have a conversation or argue that you need to go a different way, um, you know, further endangers everyone else behind you and getting out of the area. So follow the directions that they're providing you and um, we'll get everyone out in the most, uh, the safest and most efficient way that we can. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to add that uh, really if folks if, if folks are seeing issues, please report those to us. We, we know there's a lot of locations that are just regularly used as party spots or dispersed camping just for uh, just for folks to gather and to do things that create a risk to the community. And we really need to hear about those. So don't feel like you need to live with that problem. Report it and let us help address it. Who wants to go next? Hey, this is Pascal. I'll just I'll, I'll I'll work my way towards the final word since we're running <laughs> uh, out of time here. But I do want to say thank you to all our panelists. Uh, thank you for all of you that came together today to educate the community. I know I always learn something when I get on here from all of you, um, and and so uh, I thank you for that. I want to thank you, Pascal, for um, for hosting, and, and thank you, Bennett, today for this venue. Um, I just want to encourage the community to continue, continue to do their part to get ready. I think you've learned a lot today about how to do that. And I just want to encourage um, all of the community and reassure them, like it's already been said, that uh, the OES team on both sides of Placer, Nevada County, your first responders, your law fire folks, um, they're ready. They're ready for the 2020 wildfire season. And uh, we encourage you to do your part to be ready as well. Thank you, Paul. Who wants the final word? Hey, I'll, I'll take that opportunity. Why not? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Crystal Weather Service. I don't have three things. I have one thing, really, uh, just from our perspective, because so much good stuff's already been said, is know what a red flag warning means. Uh, and you could just Google it to find out more information. It's, it's all out there. But just, you know, use that as a tool to when you hear, okay, red flag warning is in effect for tomorrow or for today to think, you know, take a few minutes that morning when you're having your coffee and just think, about, okay, so there's an extra, you know, there's an extra risk of, of big fires today. So, you know, am, am I ready? Do I know my evacuation routes? You know, kind of, you know, think of like that tornado watch type of deal. It's like, you know, maybe heighten your preparedness um, a little bit, your situational awareness, make sure your means of communication of getting alerts um, are there. And, and I think, you know, if you treat a red flag warning like that, it will really help you just be ready in case something does happen. Excellent. And 
at the same time, if there is a red flag warning, and like you said, with your coffee, maybe also make sure that your your car is gassed up. That's that's always helpful because uh, running out of gas because you have to all of a sudden you sit in traffic and you run out of gas. Never a good look, but it really is important to to do these little pre preparations ahead of time. With that, I would like to thank everybody. Thank you so much for your time to all our panelists, uh, for our attendees. Thank you for your participation, for the questions. We'll make this uh, YouTube recording available, of course, for later viewing and all the, uh, everybody who is here, uh, it's ready, set, and then go. And uh, from Paul, um, here to all the um, to everybody thanks to everybody who put this together and all who attended activation is the first uh, step of preparedness absolutely and with that have a great afternoon and be safe <laughs>